There is no opening statement I could ever say that would truly put my feelings towards Sonic Frontiers into words. There is so much to cover, from the horrendous reveal, subsequent reputational turnaround, and overwhelmingly positive reception upon release. I can't. I just... I can't believe it. It's no secret that I've been an avid Frontiers hater, lover, mixed feelings er. I've watched this game prove all of our doubts and fears. Fears that Sonic Team was simply following trends that they couldn't hope to replicate. Then we started getting more trailers, and sure, cyberspace looked awful, and trust me, we will get to cyberspace. But despite the open world looking relatively barren, it was consistently praised by convention attendees who played the game firsthand. And once we started to get a look at the Titans, story, and cutscene aspects, we truly got the vibe of what the game was going for. And I have to admit, I was excited. And so that leads us here. What exactly spurred me into using the terms redefined and evolution when describing what this game did for the franchise? Well, I'm glad you asked. Sure, I may have used those words because I figured they were eye-catching and would hopefully garner clicks, but my use of them is nevertheless genuine, and I want to talk about why. Talk about how the gameplay is, at least for a first try, a great adaptation of the Sonic series' formula into this brand new format. Talk about how the story and characters are just as we've always envisioned them, rather than them being shallow surface-level interpretations of games past. And of course, talk about the undeniable passion and, say it with me now, ambition that was poured into this love letter to the franchise. Welcome everyone, my name is Nicholas, but it's Nick for short, and today I'm going to be talking about how Sonic Frontiers redefined the franchise. And with all those pretenses out of the way, let's talk about something I am so glad I'm happy to analyze again. The story of a Sonic game. The opening of Frontiers isn't something super out of the ordinary. It's another case of Eggman being up to no good, but the way in which it's visually presented adds so much more to it. The first person view is a great choice to really put us into the world, and the darker, sinister lighting does wonders for the atmosphere. With a sinister grin, the Mad Doctor activates what looks to be a portal by uploading some kind of software. And as things begin to go haywire, Eggman realizes that he's awoken the technological creatures of the area, leading to Eggman getting pulled into the portal he had tampered with. Elsewhere, we see Sonic atop the tornado, a sight for sore eyes to be sure. Although we've seen it a lot over the years, something about this portrayal just feels so right. As the exposition is dumped, we realize that Tails has tracked the Chaos Emeralds to their destination, the Starfall Islands. And with all our necessary information out of the way, we have our title drop. Simple, clean, confident. Sonic Frontiers. The piece doesn't last long, however, as the tornado is thrown out of the sky, sucked into an interdimensional portal. It's here where we're introduced to the concept of cyberspace, a digitized memory for Sonic to run through, but you wouldn't really know that unless you basically made the explanation up for yourself. I know I'm jumping the gun here, but I don't really care because there is no explanation for this happening, like, at all. And I'm not referring to the lack of an explanation at the start of the story, obviously it's meant to be a mystery for the player to solve later on, but I am talking throughout the entire narrative, cyberspace never, and I mean never, gets a clear explanation. Yes, you can encounter some outside of the main story dialogue instances wherever it does mention kind of how cyberspace works, how Sonic is essentially running through memories, but the fact that is so unimportant, it is not part of the main narrative, cyberspace is just bad. I know I'm getting way ahead of myself, but it's just that bad to me. But after escaping the digital dimension, Sonic wakes up and is greeted by a mysterious voice telling him what a feat it was to escape cyberspace, and how he is the key. It's obviously left cryptic to set up the mystery, but what I really appreciated was Sonic's reaction of just moving on, cause he knows the drill by now. And as we'll see throughout the course of the game, this mature facet of his character is at long last drawn to the forefront, which is greatly appreciated as a longtime fan. And it's here where the basic structure of the story begins to take its shape. Having found Amy captured in a strange cage, Sonic uses her character-specific tokens to free her, which, now that I'm typing this out loud, are these ever really explained? Why does Amy have specific tokens that free her from this cage? The cage doesn't mean anything, she's already trapped in cyberspace. I understand the token's gameplay purpose, but even a throwaway line explaining the story reason would have helped with the immersion. It's not a big deal, it's just something I quite honestly just realized while writing it out in the script. But enough of being a negative Nancy. Once Amy is rescued, we see more of what the game really shines in, and that's character writing. Amy has quite the sense of initiative carried over from her IDW characterization, which I've gone on record many times as my favorite incarnation of her character. But that's all the setup. Now we reach a scene that really captivated me. I still can't watch it without frothing at the mouth with hype. 
The sudden appearance of the first Titan has to be one of my favorite cutscenes in the entire franchise, and it finally gives me an opportunity to talk about something this series has sorely lacked for decades. Great cinematography. Watching Sonic just narrowly dodge being squashed under Giganto's weight was a fantastic way to establish a power dynamic. Following this with a zoom out that highlights the scale of the Titan, not just on its own merits, but specifically in comparison to the towering monuments of the landscape was such a fantastic idea. Some of these structures you need to dedicate an extended amount of time to climb, which really sets the vision for how grand the Titan really is. The subsequent shots of watching Giganto casually stride by the camera inching closer and closer to the ground before reaching Sonic, who stands unwavering despite the towering odds, does wonders to bring us back to Earth while still giving Sonic an equal amount of screen space to the Titan, using this dramatic angle to remind the players that they have a fighting chance. It's honestly just something I never thought I'd get to talk about with Sonic. I love film, and to see actual camera work incorporated into telling a Sonic story in the games is so refreshing. Here we have the proper introduction of Sage. And this has easily got to be one of the best villain reveals in the entire series. She's got to be the best designed humanoid Sonic character other than Eggman. But given her small stature, how can you go about making her presence seem not only ominous, but truly threatening? Easy, with stellar camera work. Upon her materialization next to the Beast, her entire design is shown as she's meant to be making herself known. As she begins to manipulate the Titan, the camera cuts to a much closer point of view, giving Sage a perspective-induced size advantage as the Titan quite literally bows to her. Further angles continue to give her substantial screen space to emphasize her power, even going as far as to show Sonic literally beneath her feet. Then that Dana kicks in and we're off, baby. If we are fortunate. It's honestly just such a great segment that truly, even after completing the game, is a standout scene in my eyes, and is one of the few times I don't think I'm reading too much into things whenever it comes to a Sonic game's presentation. All of the camera work and choreography seem genuinely purposeful, and it was such a great way to introduce the first Titan. Frankly, it is one of my favorite scenes in the entire game. However, Sonic is swiftly defeated, and once that happens, the story begins to suffer from a problem I believe all of the franchise's best narratives struggle with. That being, despite having incredible moments in isolation, the only uniting factor is a thematic one and not an actual plotline. What I mean is by halfway through Kronos Island, the story takes on a very basic structure. Sonic saves his friend, they talk about what a wacky scenario this all is, help Coco find peace which also gives them a glimpse into the past, fulfill that friend's character arc, and it all caps off with a titan boss fight. Although the formula does make sense, especially from a gameplay perspective, and doesn't not work, I can't help but feel left wanting more. But before talking about the few consistent plot elements, I want to go over Amy, Knuckles, and Tails' arcs and interactions with Sonic individually, as I'm sure you've all guessed, I adored them. With Amy being relegated to the first island, a lot of her optional dialogue is of the what's going on here variety, but her main character arc is helping out the first of many Coco we see throughout our adventure. This Coco is searching for their one true love, and naturally, Amy is incredibly sympathetic to its plight, leading us to hunting down the Coco's missing partner. While from the outset, this may sound like it doesn't give the character much to do, in actuality, showing how compassionate Amy is was fantastic to see. I love the fact that Amy has been integrated into the main cast, upgrading the trio to a quadruple threat, and this game is justifying it by giving Amy a specific perspective that she brings to the team that no one else has. That perspective being her endless compassion and optimism. I think this is best shown when Sonic gets fed up with helping the Coco. His suggestion to let them wrap it up on their own shows his impatience and focus on the bigger picture, which is honestly really in character, I feel. But Amy refutes the idea instantly, coming to understand Sonic's reasoning, but her unwavering need to help everyone shines through. This really established her, to me anyways, as the heart of the group. Her love of the little things in life, willing to literally stop and smell the roses, was a great direction to steer her character into, as it builds on pre-existing attributes of her personality and enhances them with a stronger foundation. This is the first of many things I saw that inspired the video's title. The game, in my opinion, expertly redefined Amy's personality. Knuckles, I feel, was pretty ham-fistedly put into this story. I was thinking about both his introduction and future scenes we'll discuss, as they are great, but the prologue animation being something you have to go out of your way to find makes his inclusion into the story feel incredibly anticlimactic. Speaking of that prologue, though, it was freaking sick, dude. More Angel Island exploration and lore and chow and... Uh, it was just so much great setup. It made me so interested in the origins of the Starfall Islands. But alas, here we are in the game and it's not ever really expanded upon. All we ever find out is that Angel Island and the Starfall Islands have some connections due to these ancients, but no matter where you look, we never find out explicitly what the link is beyond some similarities. 
Which, considering how much hype the game builds up with the mystery of the Ancients, is incredibly underwhelming and immensely unsatisfying to me. But we'll touch more on that later. As for Knuckles' character arc, I really enjoyed it. Watching him discover the similarities between these ruins and the ones on his home is really fascinating, even if not dived into as much as I'd like. What has to be his standout moment, though, is this final cutscene before facing the Titan. It's really sad that this was the case, but seeing Sonic cautiously approach a contemplative Knuckles shows more character depth and awareness than anything the franchise has seen in the last 10 years. This was such a nice touch to open this cutscene with. As Knuckles begins to voice his feelings, he talks about finally having something to directly relate to. That being, the cataclysm that wiped out the Coco being similar to his ancestors is such a great way to naturally make Knuckles think about who he is. Bringing his loneliness to the forefront was such a great move because it is a fundamental aspect of his character that contextualizes his standoff nature. And of course, Sonic's line reminding Knuckles that he may be the last Echidna, but he's not alone, felt like such a great payoff for the entire series thus far. It really reminded me that these aren't just Sonic's friends, nope, there's so much more. These characters, Sonic, Tails, Knuckles, and Amy, more than any other characters in the series, have such a great bond and history. These four, especially given all they've gone through together, are truly a family. Plus, with how Knuckles says he's gonna try to get out and live a little more, I think it'd be awesome to have him out treasure hunting and whatnot. And of course, seeing these two giving each other crap over and over, obviously joking, was so refreshing. These two at this point are total bros, and I love to see the comedy between them, both the spoken and physical kind. With all their sass, it was just an amazing viewing experience. Tails was the one I was definitely most excited to see, bar none. He has been so inconsistent in the mainline canon that how can you even begin to address that? Tails upon his rescue is so competent and logical in his assessments. Giving him such a mechanical thinking mind provides lots of opportunities to grow and mature emotionally without resetting him to zero in terms of previous development. It's best seen when helping out the engineering Coco. Tails thinks helping it is dishonest, seeing as it's already dead, but is swayed when Sonic points out the emotional reasoning behind why they should help. But one of my favorite scenes with Tails is one that somehow sparked a bit of controversy. Tails talking to Sonic about his wildly inconsistent behavior over the last decade, of unjust incompetence and how he wants to grow and change, I feel was a great piece of meta writing. Keeping the reason for his inconsistencies in the realm of his youth I think isn't justified necessarily, but the fact it was addressed in any form earns my respect. They could have easily just ignored everything, but they chose to address it at all, and that is something I very much appreciate as a fan. Without a doubt though, the best scene with Tails in my opinion is him confronting Sonic about leaving on his own. It is by far better than any game before shows just how close these two are as brothers. Having Sonic directly address Tails as little bro is so sweet, and Tails talking about how he plans to grow into a more independent person really tugs at the heartstrings when Sonic realizes his little buddy's growing up. And to really seal the deal on this cutscene, having Sonic call Tails partner at the very end is just... Man, that's some really good character writing there. I almost shed a tear whenever I first saw it. Overall, with the main characters, I feel they got great portrayals that will undoubtedly result in some changes for them in the future, but those changes seem natural and earned, so I can't wait to see them. Sonic, as you've undoubtedly picked up on, is finally back to his peak characterization. All I could think about was how much his writing reminded me of the cutscenes from Sonic and the Black Knight, and it makes me so unbelievably happy to say that. The best moment for Sonic in the game, though, is easily when taking down the towers. There is one essential element that I believe is undeniably true whenever we're talking about writing for Sonic the Hedgehog, and that is, his actions speak louder than his words. And although I do love his heroic speeches, somehow he always knows just the right thing to say because of his simplistic life philosophy, I do think that it can result in sometimes he gets a little wordy. And personally, I think that a lot of his longer speeches can be boiled down to and simplified into a nod of acknowledgement. It always just packs more of a punch whenever I think about it that way. And where I think this undoubtedly reigns true is when the towers worsen the corruption he has. He can barely move, much less run. Sage appears and asks how he's still even going. His response being a perfect silence. He doesn't respond to her. He just raises his head and keeps pressing onwards with that classic Sonic smirk on his face. Seeing Sonic finally back was so therapeutic. I was genuinely blown away by my personal take being that this is by far the best Sonic has ever been characterized. Mr. Flynn, if you so happen to see this, thank you so much for bringing my favorite character in all of fiction back on top. Seeing this means the world to me. Sage, however, I feel is a massive disappointment. Now, I know that is a massive change of pace from constant praise to serious critique, but let me explain myself. Despite being a fantastic addition to the main series cast conceptually, I feel that what could have been a genuinely great arc was bogged down by poor pacing. 
Sage is the only consistent piece of plot other than Sonic, and I really liked what they were going for. Seeing Sonic through this whole adventure, helping the Coco and interacting with his friends, slowly causing her to defy her programming and long for a family, that is a great arc, but in execution, it reigns hollow. We find out in one of these sparse Eggman-centered cutscenes that Sage is an AI built by Eggman, which is helping him escape cyberspace, which he was captured in in the beginning of the game. But Eggman only ever treats her with respect, and not so much a fatherly admiration. Despite my Pollock's attempts to add something a bit extra with his vocal delivery, which is amazing as always, there was never a familiar bond on display. Yes, the voice memos add a lot to the story, but whenever serious development like calling Sage his daughter is borderline side content, that's a real problem in my eyes. And this unfortunately leads to the game's ending feeling rather shallow. Not to mention, three-fourths of her dialogue is the vague, leave now or you will doom us all nonsense. By Island 2, we're given the necessary context as to why she won't tell Sonic the truth. It's because Eggman told her not to, and she also kept him alive to watch because she was fascinated by the emotions on display. But I believe that she should have made way less appearances because that way you would emphasize each time that she does show emotion. It would have made her cutscenes of emotional struggle and development stand out a lot more. Also, I feel like this has to be a direct response from the Egget fan art from Mania. I believe that's what her name was, but I think that that would be such a cool reason for Sage to exist now is because us fans thought that that would be a cool idea. Regardless, it really grounds Eggman emotionally, which is something I never thought I wanted, but here I am loving the idea of him taking on a fatherly role to Sage. It honestly feels like a natural evolution of his dynamic with Metal Sonic as he's a proud pops of that robot. Eggman in general though, I didn't love. He had his moments to be sure, his writing is a serious step up over anything we've had in the last decade, but that's such a low bar, it doesn't really count. What put me off with the character was I don't like how respectful he is towards the heroes. In cutscenes and Eggman logs, I found that he has so much good to say about the heroes and it feels a little out of character to me. I don't always need him saying I hate that hedgehog, and I do appreciate a little bit of respect thrown in, but there was way too much for me. Me personally, I do prefer his loud, boasting nature, and need more villainy to balance out all this kindness if they stick with a more humanized interpretation of the Doctor. Just to clarify, I'm not against what they're doing with Eggman as far as character goes, but I am going to need to see more of this version of the Doctor, because there was not a lot of screen time for him in this game. But on the topic of a more humanized nature, we actually got an ounce of Eggman backstory? Him talking about Maria was so out of left field, like, him talking about the Black Arms or the Babylonians was awesome enough, but for Eggman to actively reflect on not knowing Maria, feeling an ounce of resentment towards all the attention she got that he didn't, I thought was so incredible. Generally, I prefer the characters' backstories in this series to be kept vague, because I don't really think that they add much, but little things like this are great, because it actually informs his current feelings when he's questioning if Maria and Sage were anything alike. Plus, it also adds some insight that maybe all of that resentment turned Eggman into the evil tyrant we know today. I really like whenever these little droplets of lore actually inform how the characters act now. I don't really need a lot more of this, but little tiny things like this, I do seriously appreciate. But now we come to the ending, or should I say, lack thereof. After learning the secrets of the ancients by bringing down these towers, all that hype, all of that buildup, all of my anticipation was rewarded with a set of generic aliens running away from a threat more bland than infinite. As for the final boss being revealed as the voice guiding Sonic along his journey, it didn't really have much impact as the voice in Sonic barely had any interactions to make this twist matter. Nor does it feel clever, because in the same scene as this reveal, we find out that Sage never told Eggman that this massive world-ending creature was stuck in cyberspace. Why? I mean, knowing Eggman and his past exploits, couldn't he have wanted to potentially harness the power of this creature? Or if it was truly so dangerous, why didn't she tell Eggman to protect him? Well, there is no reason why. It just doesn't make sense why she wouldn't let him know such crucial information. As for the other lore drops, the ancients building these massive mechs to fight off this super threat was really cool, but their place within the lore, bringing the emeralds to Earth, are all just cool ideas that ultimately didn't add much to anything, I feel. Sure, we technically know more, but this knowledge doesn't really add anything to the overall canon. I should stress that I really do enjoy all the continuity welding found within this game, since it's very rare that we get something like that but I think it could have been so much more and here's why. If anything, it spawned more questions like why was the Master Emerald on Earth? Doesn't this affect Unleashed's story? What even is chaos? Of course, the story does imply that the Ancients moved to Angel Island, but if that means the Ancients somehow became Chow, then that's just dumb in my opinion. It's a needless retcon that doesn't enhance what the Chow are or add new depths to chaos existing. If anything, it kind of diminishes what the Ancients are by making them literal babies in the future. But that's just a fan theory because of Chaos being a mutated Chow and his clear design link to the Ancients. 
So I understand the basis of the theory, but I just don't like the conclusion being drawn for these reasons that I've listed out. While talking about Chaos though, he has literally no personality in Adventure 1, and knowing he's related to the Ancients doesn't mean anything. In fact, the story of Sonic Adventure 1 remains entirely unchanged in a post-Sonic Frontiers era, because as far as we can tell, Chaos, the Chow, no new concepts introduced in Frontiers actually changes how we look at past stories. Quite literally, all this knowledge does is give us some admittedly appreciated answers, but given the undercooked narrative as a whole, I feel the Ancients weren't important enough within this very game to make me care about them, and thus, I don't care about their effect on the series as a whole. Most surprisingly for me was that the mysterious symbol that we've seen all throughout the game's trailers and on several occasions during the game was never truly explained. Granted, it's not difficult to piece together what the symbol does mean, and the fact that it's never explicitly explained is not my problem. My problem is that it felt like such a great natural way to see what the culture of these aliens were, but we never get anything like that. So many aspects of the game feel like they were so explicitly, purposefully established to give us a glimpse into the culture of the Ancients, but were forgotten as quickly as they were established. If you think that I and many other players who have had these exact same issues cannot read between the lines, I assure you, we can. I understand purposeful vagueness and leaving things up to interpretation are effective methods of storytelling. There's a lot of good examples in this very game, in fact, especially through environmental details. But other than maybe the symbol, that didn't feel at all like the intent. Overall, the story felt very undercooked and introduced so many great ideas, but never did anything more with it. I personally would have much rather preferred an entirely original alien species, and the whole point of the game was seeing their long-lasting impact on the Sonic world that we've never noticed before. But I digress. Back on the main story, as far as Sonic and Eggman teaming up, I actually really do enjoy how that was handled. I thought it was super fun to see. And I've seen a lot of complaints about how Sonic's friends saving him from cyberspace makes no sense, and well, they're right, but I don't know, I've suspended my disbelief so much for way less, this doesn't bother me too much. But here we go, the final titan has been released, the final boss, the monster we only saw glimpses of in flashbacks, the ultimate threat bigger than anything Sonic has ever faced before. And it's nothing. Sure, the last boss fight's easy, but who cares if the story carries the slack, right? Well, I was being very literal when I said nothing. Supreme has no character at all, and the quote-unquote secret final boss is a random space shooter against the moon. Why this hasn't gotten more flack, in my opinion, is just insane. I've seen this series go through hell and back for way less than this. I'm sorry, but Ian Flynn somehow managed to make a villain less relevant, consequential, and somehow less interesting than Infinite. As the game went on, I'm gonna be honest, I thought Infinite was gonna show back up. Whenever the moon started saying how powerful it was, how it was truly infinite, I was seriously expecting Infinite to just come out of nowhere. And the only reason I thought that outlandish scenario was even plausible was because the end was so aggressively nothing. And to cap it all off, I'm meant to be invested when Sage sacrifices herself to destroy the end and save Sonic? Look, maybe being a fan of this series so long has just made me incredibly cynical. Maybe I've just lost emotional investment, but seeing as how the IDW comics have gotten serious emotional reactions from me, I just think that this arc was not strong enough to make me cry. And this isn't me trying to act all tough and, you know, shame people who did cry. If you genuinely thought that this arc was great, emotional, and impactful, all the power to you. It's just a matter of disagreeing on the effectiveness of the story. But honestly, if Sage had conquered the most truly diabolical villain in the series, I think that that would have given her decision so much more weight and impact. But as it stands, it felt like her sacrifice was for nothing more than shock value. Not for a second did I believe that she was truly gone, especially wasted on a villain so aggressively bland. The finale of Sonic Frontier's story is so nothing, my jaw genuinely dropped when I beat the game. And not because I was stunned by how much I enjoyed it, but wondering where the rest of it was. Don't get me wrong, the game felt complete, the game felt purposeful, but at the tail end of everything, it just felt like they wanted one more island, one more unique circumstance to really put Sonic through hell. But unfortunately, maybe due to time or just a lack of creativity, they couldn't quite piece together what they wanted to do. And so it really feels like the game would have been more satisfying if it ended after the third island, because whenever you have a finale that is so bland, having to go through what is essentially a recreation of the first island before it, it just makes everything all the more unsatisfying to me. However, even with all of my criticism, all of my just being a negative Nancy as I tend to do these days, 
I love the final cutscenes of Sonic Frontiers. Having everyone reunited free from cyberspace and ready to take charge of their lives on new adventures, solo adventures, which is just so intriguing. Eggman mourning Sage and then, to no one's surprise, recovering her files was such a heartwarming thing to see. Even if I didn't love the arc, I'm just happy that Eggman gets an emotional win for once. It's such a new, cool way to look at his character. But what I really felt from this final cutscene, aside from shock that Styx is now mainline series canon, was just such a sense of pride. One thing that I will always give to even the worst of Sonic games is that they were proud to be a Sonic game. And for the first time in over a decade, I just felt the developers giving us a wink, you know? They saw all us fans and said, we're back, and we're here to stay, and we're proud of it. It really did make me appreciate all the great parts of Frontiers all the more. I for sure had my fair share of issues, and I do believe that a lot of this game really could have used just a few more months of fine-tuning in terms of its story, but for what we did get, I really do love it. The character interactions from all the main series cast was truly something magical to see again. In my opinion, it's the best they've ever been characterized in the series, period. And even for the aspects that I didn't think were executed greatly, I think that they established such an amazing foundation that we could really see take charge in a sequel, and although it's not an excuse, the fact that we likely have an epilogue for the game coming in future DLC really makes me feel like they can turn that finale around. Give the entire story a much more satisfying conclusion, and that way, upon future playthroughs, you'll have a much more complete narrative experience. I think that Frontiers has a lot in common with my feelings towards 06 in a way. A lot of it from a narrative design perspective just fails, and it relies on its characters to carry that story, but the characters are so strong, even the new ones have such a great foundation. And despite all my criticisms, I'd say that this is genuinely one of the better stories in the franchise, if only for its characters. What can I say? Whenever I talk about a Sonic story on this channel, I think it's only fair to really dig into its plot, see if it works on a narrative design level, but even if it doesn't, if the characters, emotions, overall vibes, for lack of a better word, are there, I always manage to find something to enjoy. And in terms of the entire storyline of Sonic Frontiers, I loved the story of this game. Not for its plot or its narrative, but because of the character, because of the emotions, because of the themes on display, I thought it soared. Despite all my criticisms looking back, I really did enjoy experiencing its story. And now I think it's about time that we talk about one of the biggest shakeups the series has ever taken. The gameplay. Sonic at last controls like he should again, within the parameters of just being controllable, because make no mistake, this is me praising the bare minimum. He can turn and has a great range of motion that isn't too precise or sensitive and has a great standard traversal speed. I say standard because there are a multitude of sliders to adjust aspects of Sonic's controls, but I left all mine at default and had a great time. Sonic is just the right speed that his default running feels so right and cinematic to me to put it some way. I feel so in control and love taking my surroundings at an upbeat pace. And on top of that, you can still boost. The boost speed, especially when doubled by a max ring count, lets me speed across the island at Mach 2. Blasting around the terrain just feels so therapeutic as a player, I feel like I have the full extent of Sonic's movement capability at my disposal. Truly, running fast was the best part of the game, and the speed at which you can cross terrain is just filled with the exaggerated swagger of a blue hedgehog. The boost itself, I'm incredibly grateful was nerfed, because I've said for years the boost formula wouldn't work in an open world, especially not how it was in previous titles. But personally, the fact that the boost got weakened to such an extent, to me, validates what I've always claimed. If the boost can't even be a true boost, then just make the game momentum based. Having the landscape designed around running up and down hills, rolling for top speed, and spin dash jumping your way to victory is just so much more skill based, and naturally becomes more rewarding for it. And speaking of jumping, it really sucks that jumping hardly carries your momentum, it really makes you feel the restrictiveness of airborne traversal. The air boost from forces actually would have been a great inclusion to see here, because the air boost that we got cuts your momentum from slow to nothing. I do enjoy the trick system and concept, as well as since it's basically right out of the fan game Sonic GT, but it's more often than not activated by weird collision detection. The jankiness of how at times it looks like Sonic is under 10 times normal gravity can really take away from the athleticism of the gameplay. And although travel is still fun and the game is designed around these issues, making them borderline non-issues, I do think that these are telltale examples of kinks to be ironed out. I think that the heaviness of Sonic that I just mentioned is most obvious in cyberspace. These levels suck. The control was clearly not designed for traditional boost stages, especially whenever you consider that they've been outright stolen. 
The only times I ever found cyberspace remotely fun was the adventure levels, because they feel more attuned to the traditional platforming this Sonic was built for. I don't care to give these levels the time of day. They suck and are an active blemish on an otherwise immensely enjoyable experience. On the combat side, the homing attack and attack system overall started off really solid. The first mini-boss, though, was what really got my attention when it came to proving the combat was something to be enjoyed. I was taking damage. I know, crazy, right? But in a Sonic game, actively being challenged and punished for my mistakes again? Thank you, goodness gracious me. It's been so long. But the balancing was a little skewed because, good lord, I got nervous real fast after seeing just how much of the skill tree I unlocked on the first upgrade. I opened that menu expecting to, you know, unlock one or two upgrades, but I was just breezing through it. I got through half the tree in no time on the first island. But luckily, it's not that easy to unlock the tree in one go. Obviously, some of the higher skill ones require a lot of skill points. Platforming also really took me by surprise by just how intense it was in the open world. It required a lot more split-seconds decisions than normal, where you have to use the air boost a lot more than I anticipated. Even simple challenges where, like I said, just using an air boost or a double jump in the right time to get across a gap really showed me that this game was asking more of me than what Sonic games typically do. That said, things never really get any deeper than this. In my opinion, the further you do progress, the more cracks begin to show. A lot of Sonic's late game moves require you to press the bumper or trigger buttons to activate them, which can lead you to accidentally dodging, boosting, or using a move on accident. I noticed this most in the tower climbing section, where I accidentally used a super move on an enemy when all I wanted to do was boost closer for a more certain homing attack range. Granted, that doesn't happen very often, but it is so annoying whenever you want to do a move, but the game doesn't register the fact that you pressed an additional button after the bumper or trigger. Or, on the opposite spectrum, you press the bumper or trigger, but you pressed a different button very quickly after trying to use a different move, and then all of a sudden you're boosting somewhere random. Sure, I eventually got used to it and perfected my timing, but I just feel like it's one of those systems where it's not complicated enough for you to need to get used to it, and could have honestly been simplified. I think pressing two face buttons at once like other combat-heavy titles would have been a better, more responsive compromise. For example, instead of pressing the bumper and then the A button, how about instead you press the A and X button at the same time? That way, in a worst-case scenario, the worst you have to deal with is an extra punch being thrown or an extra jump, which isn't very detrimental. And given the fact that there aren't too many moves in this game, I feel like memorizing those button combinations would not be too intrusive and it would be just as good. As for Sonic's moves themselves, they were varied and stylish, and always fun to unlock. However, the recovery ability, where you are given the chance to press A after taking damage to retaliate, I found rarely appeared outside of boss fights, and given how busted the parry system is, I believe it was a waste of a move slot. And oh yes, whenever I say that the parry system is busted, that is 100% a critique. Having the parry system not work off timing, but only holding down the left and right bumper negated all skill. It made sitting and waiting to be hit a very viable strategy, as the retaliation move you get by pressing X and Y is so much damage. I'm sure like the majority of other players did, I also played on hard mode, and I feel like all of us can agree that there was really no challenge at any point in the game whatsoever. Of course, the new non-combat exclusive ability Sonic has is the Psy Loop. The ability was an incredibly fun one, as it opened up so many possibilities of combat strategy and puzzle interactions. Granted, none of those elements are particularly taxing on the mind, as combat strats is mainly just making a circle, and puzzles are again really just making a circle, but nevertheless, I found the side loop is a more than welcome addition to Sonic's moveset. As you've undoubtedly noticed, I've prefaced a lot of my statements regarding the combat and puzzle facets of gameplay with clarifying their lack of depth. This was entirely purposeful, and I feel one of the biggest contributors to that is the poor button mapping combined with a refusal to get rid of old moves. Obviously, you can go and change the buttons for yourself, but several of Sonic's moves, such as the Flying Kick, Sphere Attack, all could be used, as I said before, as combo buttons of X plus A and Y plus B. And with this one simple change, you could increase the ferocity of enemy attacks and the variation they have, because now the player has both dodge buttons always open and ready for use. That means that you no longer need them for combat, meaning that you can make Sonic's parry move timing-based instead of just holding both buttons down and waiting. I think that overall, with just simple changes like that to really free up Sonic's movement, I think could really do some great things to make the combat for the next game even greater and really engaging and satisfying. Overall, I think the foundation set here in terms of combat, puzzle solving, is a really good start. But I feel like it has so many little faults that hold it back, and truly believe that if the dev team takes a serious look at what they've made, 
they could create bar none the best gameplay loop the Sonic series has ever seen in 3D, and I mean that wholeheartedly. Before talking about the open zones though, I have to mention both the mini-bosses and Titan encounters. Mini-bosses were a great way to earn portal keys. They all follow a general principle of taking one specific aspect of Sonic's moveset and centering an entire fight around it. Although it can lead to subsequent rematches being a little stale, I do think that generally speaking it's an incredibly effective strategy of creating mini-bosses. The standouts I feel were easily Sumo, Shark, and the Squid fights for the spectacle and engaging gameplay. They all lasted just the right amount of time before I got tired of them. Now, the Titans. I think most Sonic boss fights suck. They're too gimmicky, and I just don't really have a great time, but these have set a new bar so high, every other attempt at a Sonic boss fight crumbles in comparison. The minigame preludes were always a joy to experience, and the fight themselves really put your combat moves to the test. I personally didn't realize the parry wasn't timing based until the third island, so that definitely made my life harder, but even so, getting to use all of my newly acquired base Sonic moves in his super state was always so rewarding and awesome to see. Not to mention how great the quick side loop was at destabilizing the boss and delivering some juicy retribution afterwards. And although I don't normally do this, I'm just gonna give my ranking for funsies. The final boss Supreme really sucked. I made things way more complex than they were whenever I first fought the boss, and the second I realized that, it completely fell apart. In third we have Wyvern, who despite probably having the best spectacle, was pretty simple once you figured it out. Giganto easily takes the second place spot. It provided such a great early game challenge, it has one of the best designs out of all of the Titans. And one of my personal favorite aspects was just how much Evangelion design DNA Giganto had in its blood. From its overall combination of mechanical and monstrosity and those awesome Shin Godzilla lasers coming out of his back, my blood started pumping whenever the fight kicked into high gear. And I'm sure to no one's surprise, the night fight is by leaps and bounds the best fight in the game. With a great balance of base game combat combined with specific gimmicks, the fight was a rewarding blast from start to finish. And don't you worry, I'll talk about those legendary vocal tracks in just a moment. No matter how fun a character is to control, the world you place them in can make or break the experience, and, well, these sure are three and a half islands. Honestly, Chronos Island I still think is really solid. Lots of wall running around, tons of fun things to climb and explore, and my personal favorite aspect being the borderline non-existent amount of 2D. Heck, there might not be any 2D anywhere in Chronos Island, and that is so refreshing. Plus, given the smaller nature of the island's scope, the pop-in wasn't such a big deal, despite it being inherently jarring. Ares had to be a highlight for me, with its massive and layered structure. It made getting around feel rewarding, there were a lot of fun and much more engaging platforming challenges. And although I'm not a massive fan of the desert aesthetic, even now I think that it's kind of bland whenever I go back to it, it didn't get old as fast as I thought it would. Unfortunately, there's no way I can sugarcoat this. The environmental design falls off, and hard. One of the most vivid notes I remember writing was only a few minutes after I got to Chaos Island. I wrote down, there is already way too much 2D on this last island, which says two very important things. That the first two islands really were what I was looking for in a brand new Sonic game, something that finally felt like a 3D action platformer. Be that as it may, considering how often challenges end or begin with launching you into some random direction far from where you started, locking you into place for upwards to 5 seconds, completely taking away control from the player is extremely annoying. But Chaos Island has so many 2D sections, it isn't just annoying for traversal purposes, but actively reminded me several times of the game's shortcomings. All of these platforming challenges are not in the slightest integrated into the island's structure and architecture. Rather, it's quite literally just as we all feared from the beginning, just a bunch of floating platforms and grind rails, which personally look horrendous to me, but given the context in the game, I don't really mind the idea. I absolutely think it's reaching to say that the futuristic style and random pop-in in the game is an aesthetic choice, it's definitely a limitation of some kind, I'm not exactly sure what to blame, but it's definitely not supposed to be there. And that's what destroyed the illusion for me. The lack of striking art direction. The islands look generic as can be, but I've always enjoyed the realistic approach to Sonic's world, so that didn't bug me. What did was how every single rail, platform, spring, dash pad, launch ramp, and any other design obstacle shared the exact same design. Not a single one of those objects has specific textures, particle effects, or even different colors to help them blend in with their island's environment. It's just one of those little design things that I think could have seriously elevated the entire game's art direction, but to see how it is now, it's just lazy. 
This is more of a nitpick, but the ruins always look unanimous across all islands, which I understand, but considering how they're supposed to be weathered, I think having different conditions for their weathering based on their environment would have been a really nice little touch. As stated a moment ago, I didn't realize these things at first because of how much fun I was having, and I'll say now that despite its clearly rushed nature and questionable production values, I think the fun factor for this title is what saved it for me. But Chaos Island is so clearly slapped together at the last second that it pulls all the game's very real, very valid flaws front and center on full display. But that was only the first in two important things my notes pointed out, the second being how horribly the game was paced in my opinion. As I said in the story section, things can get monotonous very quickly, because this game is a very functional but never changing formula, and the same can be said for the gameplay. The first three islands were really fun despite their flaws, and had a natural sense of progression of aesthetic leading me to believe that the game would be wrapping up pretty soon by the end of Chaos Island, especially after that god awful pinball minigame took the wind out of my sails. I actually enjoyed most of these minigames with their cute challenges challenges and funky tune, but the pinball one was such a drag. But after defeating the final titan, all of a sudden I'm reminded there's not one, but two more islands. Sure, we need a final boss, so maybe one more, but two? During my first playthrough, my initial thoughts were, alright, let's give this fourth island a shot. I'm still having a great time playing the game despite me seeing more of its cracks, so I'm excited to see what this next island holds. Then I found it's just a story segment and nothing else. It honestly seems a little dishonest to sell this game with the idea that there's five islands, but who knows, maybe the last one will blow me away. It did not. <laughs> the last island, Oranos Island, is just the other half of Kronos because they split it apart, I assume, to give the game one last section. Even ignoring the sense of padding you get just by seeing the repeated visuals, you also collect more emeralds on your own because of the lack of minigames, meaning you spend longer doing the same thing over and over than in any other island. Another repetitious element is that Sage's memory tokens, they're just Amy's again in design, and collecting them feels so few and far between. Not a single one of these shortcomings felt purposeful whether for thematic or difficulty balance intent, rather because the dev team lacked time or ideas, and I feel it's more likely it was a time thing. Being honest, I ended up doing the fishing minigame to farm for the last of Sage's tokens because I had grown so bored by this endgame. As an aside, yes, the fishing game is a fun and great way to earn some extra tokens and the voice memos, regardless of how I feel about those memos being side content. This game in both story and gameplay started off so strong, peaked around the halfway mark, and never really recovered for me. Everything felt blown out and undercooked. Despite my gripes in Chaos Island, I still have fun whenever I play in that location because it feels like there is a great amount of things to do. I always feel like there's something to find around the corner. With these last two islands, I mean, sure, the fourth, I do find really fun and engaging as a platforming section, but other than that, there's nothing to do, and this fifth island has everything so spaced out that it genuinely feels like I'm constantly searching, begging for something fun to pop up, but it takes so long that it just makes me bored. Not to mention how the pop-up makes this even more egregious, because even if I am looking way into the distance, nothing will have spawned in there, so I have to keep running around hoping that I'm gonna run into something that triggers a pop-in. Not to say there weren't elements to enjoy in the end game story and gameplay, it still has that fun factor with a few really cool pieces of terrain, enemies to fight, and things to see, but overall it just doesn't compare to how the game starts. There's no sugarcoating this though, I've said it once and I'll say it again, cyberspace was bad in both story and gameplay. Sonic's controls were clearly not created with these stages in mind, and while completely playable, it really emphasizes the sluggishness of the boost now and how poorly Sonic handles in these tight corridors. I don't mind the fact that special levels are created to be more or less special stages, in fact, I applaud it. It's a great idea. It just feels very half-baked. While on the topic of progression, though, I'd like to reiterate that using the gears to unlock the cyberspace levels, and then those cyberspace levels rewarding you with keys, which finally unlock the Chaos Emerald Vaults, was a great method of progression. Seeing this gameplay loop refined with better special stages would become a welcome aspect of future Open Zone titles. But with all the main elements of this package out of the way, how does it communicate these aspects? It's one of the most defining elements of any Sonic game, so let's check out Sonic Frontier's presentation. The voice acting is some of the best in the series as far as I'm concerned, with a vocal direction that treats these characters as more mature, experienced. Sure, they have that adventurous thrill in them, but they always cut the crap and get down to business whenever things get serious. 
Overall, I gotta say, I'm really a fan of the more quote-unquote adult vocal direction, as after all these years, I view Sonic as more of a really experienced, adventurous 18-year-old. Heck, I've always kind of had Canon Tails being a preteen by now. I definitely don't think that their aging up should be, like, serious and really change their fundamental aspects of their character, but I'm always open to seeing different interpretations of these characters as long as the core values remain the same. I don't think it's much of a secret to admit that my favorite interpretations of these characters is more often than not found in 06, Black Knight, or the current IDW run, and I feel like this really shows why that's the case. These performances is how I've always internally heard these characters' voices, and I really hope that this sticks around. That said, I do think Roger needs to lighten up just a bit. I understand his voice fits the somber tone, but I think if he's going to stick around, we need a happier middle ground between this and his performance in Frontiers for him to truly perfect his sonic voice. Another little thing is how the voice direction I thought could prove a little inconsistent. Sometimes characters would be using the wrong tone for certain lines, and that could be a little distracting depending on the scene. The writing as praised previously is great throughout in terms of character interaction, and to see that, it's best to just go watch the cutscenes themselves, but the humor was surprisingly good as well. I gotta give the what is your goal joke props because it is the first time I've ever audibly laughed while playing a Sonic game. Cutscenes I thought were surprisingly well animated. Overall, I just felt like the choreography was so much more interesting. Everything felt much more lively and filled with personality this time around, easily a step up from any game we've had before. Before we completely leave the topic of animation, I will say that the trick animations look way too stiff and dialogue exchanges being so stilted is fine, I guess, but I would appreciate more effort. Needless to say, the music was fantastic throughout. Although I can't remember too much of the soundtrack off the top of my head, listening to the OST in the background has shown me this has got to be one of my top 5 Sonic OSTs. The background music has to have some of the best choices in terms of instruments and composition the Sonic series has ever seen bar none. Unfortunately, the Forces style EDM music I'm not a massive fan of. However, that cannot be said for the vocal tracks, because every last one of them I've had on loop since release. The Titan fights are amazing, and the ending songs are so emotional, I could cry to them out of context anytime, any day. And of course, I can't forget the main theme, I'm Here, which is honestly kind of weak for me, or at least it used to be. It was pretty outshined by basically every song in the game at first, but the more I listen to it, the more I can't stop loving it, and it's swiftly becoming one of my favorite, if not my favorite song in the entire game. Even after all these months since release, I haven't gotten sick of these tunes, genuinely some of the best the series has ever offered in terms of vocal compositions. And I suppose that's as good a segue as any to talk about my... Final thoughts on this game. With me dealing with college, personal obligations, and such, this video has taken a lot longer than I would have liked to come out. I remember whenever the game first dropped, I thought to myself, I'm gonna have this out within the month. No, within the week, but that was a bit overzealous of me. I've recorded three chunks of this audio and segments. The first, back relatively whenever the game came out, the second middle chunk a month or so ago, and this last one right now. But I do think in many ways, this delay was, honestly, the best for the video. I've had so much time to sit and really think about how I feel about this game. To go back and just run around for fun, replay the entire game, re-experience the entire game, see some of the incredible work modders have already gotten to less than half a year after its release. And of course, seeing what other people in the community have to say about this title, and interacting with you all on Twitter and my other social media platforms. I love Sonic Frontiers. It's easily my favorite Sonic game, and one of the main reasons for that is I feel like I'm really playing a Sonic game. I mean for the first time since 06. Heck, the first time since SA2, I felt like I was truly in control of Sonic in a fun 3D platformer. Not a racing game, not a gimmicky mess, and not a spin-off. Just playing a fun 3D platformer starring Sonic the Hedgehog. From what I can tell, that's why a lot of others have fallen in love with the game, just as I have. But how sad is that? How embarrassing that this multimedia juggernaut is producing a game that does the bare minimum, letting you play as a fun-to-control character. How embarrassing that this multimedia juggernaut clearly had bigger plans for its story, but likely due to a rushed production combined with the laughably small dev team, we have another undercooked story. How embarrassing that a multimedia juggernaut is only now reaching the bare minimum requirements to create a great game and somehow fall far below the standards of a AAA title in this day and age with unpolished physics and visuals. It's just plain embarrassing. 
please understand that for the sake of presentation, I am making this all sound insanely dramatic, but I do think that I am making a real point here. I understand that Sega is largely to blame, if not solely. They aren't giving Sonic Team the manpower it needs. Only having 60 developers is insane for a title of this scope, and I am in shock and awe that the game came out this good. But that's not an excuse. It shouldn't be that way. I'm tired of Sonic always having some kind of caveat where people say, hopefully they can improve this next time in regards to the large problems of core mechanics. But I wrote down those sentiments very shortly after the game came out, and this is another reason I'm so glad this video took as long as it did to get released. Even though from the start, since day one of this game's launch, it feels more than ever Sonic Team really cares about Sonic again. And given the amount of post-launch support and community feedback they're taking into account, Sega seems more than ever willing to pour money into this franchise. Things like a larger budget whenever it comes to future Sonic Team related titles, a larger staff to really give Sonic Team the manpower it needs to make a grand game, and especially the DLC announcement, three waves of additional content with an entire epilogue of a story in more playable characters screams more than ever a strong and firm confidence in the Sonic the Hedgehog brand. I know I can be very harsh on Sonic titles, both in story, gameplay, all of it really, but I think I've made it very clear with my entire catalog of videos that it's all just because I care so much. And for the first time in over a decade, I no longer feel worried. I no longer feel like my hopes could be misplaced. I truly see the open zone format being the perfect formula for the Sonic series future. And I truly believe that Sonic Frontiers, despite its flaws, has brought Sonic back to his modern roots of ambitious confidence. All while creating a sense of grander adventures on the horizon. I truly believe that Sonic Frontiers redefined and evolved the franchise. Hello, everybody. Um, it's me, Nick, for short. <laughs> and... Hi, I know that this video took a ridiculously long time to come out. I think it's been three, maybe four months since my last video, and I apologize for that. Frankly, I knew that I wanted to at least do a Frontiers video. I was very certain about that. And I have entire other games played through, recorded, notes down. I just need to write the scripts and do the recording and like my audio and editing. But I knew that I definitely needed to get this one out. I, I cannot believe that... Even throughout my hiatuses, people keep subscribing, they keep commenting, and I mean, I always kind of did this just because I enjoyed it, I just had a passion for it, and I thought that it was just fun to analyze this series and its characters, and with Frontiers I have so much to chew on now alongside the IDW stuff. But I'm, I'm so blessed, and thank you so much for giving me this audience, all of you, even if it's just a few thousand of the seven at this point, I think. As long as I can keep one of you out there entertained with engaging content, I know that I'm doing my job. And thank you so much for watching these videos. This is my bar none biggest project ever. I think that my next project is probably going to be just as big. Hopefully it takes a lot less time to come out, but I hope that you guys will enjoy it. It's not Sonic related. I know that that's definitely what the algorithm and my audience expects of me, which I understand. I love talking about Sonic, but... At this point, I kind of just want to talk about the IDW stuff, and that definitely requires an editor because I'm not that good, so hopefully the, uh, hopefully the ad revenue will kick in and then I can hire more editors. I have the entire Metal Virus script done. I really want to make more of those, but that's definitely gonna, you know, that's definitely gonna need an editor, which, uh, that's not a, that's not a beg for money in any sense of the word. That's just a, a fact that I hope I can get pumped out to you guys soon enough. Normally, I cut out all the rambling, but I really did just want to say thank you. Thank all of you for just watching, especially if you made it to the end of this behemoth of a video. I know I, I'm really late to the party, but I think that I really had something to say and something to bring to the table. So yeah, um, <laughs> this has been, it's Nick, you know, it's Nick for short. Um, yeah, if you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe because I love entertaining you all. I love the comments. I love the support. I know that I can be a negative Nancy in a lot of my videos. It's just part of my internet persona at this point. I don't, I don't really mind. It's out of a place of caring. I think that I've made that pretty clear. And I really hope that you come back to watch my content. If you just want Sonic, then I understand that. I will do my absolute best to get the IDW stuff out as soon as I can because... 
I have so much to catch up on and get through. And if you are willing to just hear my thoughts on other stuff, hey, I am so excited for what's coming up for the channel. Sorry for all the rambling. I just wanted to kind of show you all that I'm here for all of those who want to watch. And thank you so much. Again, even if it's just one person out there, I'm going to do my best to keep you entertained for as long as I can. So thank you so much for watching and have a good rest of your day, noon, night, whatever it is. Have a good one.